Hello, everyone. This is A Bit of Business. My name is John Fitzgerald. On behalf of Learmedia.tv and the British and Irish Trading Alliance, welcome to the show. Sustainability, recycling, the green economy, all topics very much in the news right now, and for good reason, as today is Earth Day 2021, with governments now trying to take action to combat climate change, plastic pollution, and carbon emissions, many businesses are now looking for ways to become greener. Sustainability matters, and doesn't it just? Our special guests today are Tom Murphy from Pamex, the makers of de facto shaving oil, and Tom Cotter from Ocean Ore, who make clothing from plastic retrieved from the oceans. Both men are get up and go entrepreneurs that have sustainability on show right through the DNA of their organizations. They are making green cool and demonstrating that you can build a successful business based on the principles of sustainability. Tom Murphy is based in the west of Ireland where his company manufactures de facto shaving oil in Clare Morris. He is on a mission to make de facto a global brand within the next five years, and he wants to literally shave the world. He believes strongly in his product, and the brand name has been trademarked all over the world. Tom Cotter is based in Cork, and he is on a mission to reclaim the oceans by removing as much plastic as he can to recycle it into eye-catching, boldly designed clothing using eco-friendly materials and plastic-free packaging. He spent several years researching sustainable production methods that would contribute to the reduction of plastic pollution in the seas, and he is a firm believer in partnering with companies that want to go on a sustainable journey with him to make the biggest impact possible. That's it, folks. Please do remember to visit the BITA website bitta.ie for news about members and upcoming events and interesting initiatives, including the Be Plastic Aware campaign, which is bringing awareness to the amount of plastic that's being used in the construction sector and our efforts to reduce it. Tom and Tom, coming up next, please do stay tuned. Good morning, gentlemen, and a warm welcome to A Bit of Business. Thank you very much, John. This is Tom Murphy here from Castle Bar, um, and I'm delighted to be on the show with you. Tom, see you. Welcome as well. Appreciate it. Great to be here, and thanks for having me. Gents, there's a burning question that has come in from one of our viewers, and we have to answer that at the top of the show, I'm afraid. Uh, I am, of course, a, a Dublin man. Uh, Tom C, you're a Cork man. Uh, Tom M, you're a Mayo man. And the question that everybody is thinking about, can Mayo or Cork win the All-Ireland this year? <laughs> it sounds like you're lining up a nice joke there, the Dublin guy, the Mayo guy, and the Cork guy. <laughs> I, I will be openly cautious about it because I don't fancy your chances unfortunately so i'll hand over to tom m you might be a bit more positive well tom m from mayo uh here and i say that uh, yeah i i'm um, optimistic i'm a born optimist and i think the fact that uh, tom cotter from cork uh, feels <laughs> um, very very cautious about the matter i think i'll have to be a little more optimistic but uh, one thing that i will say from a football viewpoint and from, uh, I'd say, from a scientific viewpoint as well, that the last time and any time I would say that Mayo won the All-Ireland, and it's quite a number of years ago now since they last won, uh, they were all clean shaven. <laughs> and there is no doubt about it that when you have facial hair, it certainly uh, delays your speed somewhat. And I think I put it to the Mayo team now that if they were all to be clean shaven right through the championships, I think that they would have a better chance of winning the All-Ireland. Are you suggesting that they might uh, benefit from using de facto shaving oil, Tom? 
I certainly am, because it will, <laughs> it, it will help them to glide through the air. <laughs> Very good. Well, look, guys, I, I'd love to start just to get some of your reflections on your journey so far to this point. And let me start with you, Tom, Tom Cotter. And I know your backstory a little bit. I know that you were heavily influenced by your time in the Greek islands at Lafkada, and you saw what was happening in the oceans. You saw that there was potential opportunity to do something about the amount of plastic pollution in the oceans. And you've built this wonderful business called Ocean Ore. What has been the biggest challenge for you along the journey to get to this point? It's a good question. To so many challenges, I would say. Um, I think the biggest challenge in all business really is to try and get to where you want to go with such little resources. That's, you know, the biggest, the biggest issue. I'm very fortunate now that we've gotten to a stage where we've got a brilliant team in place, but for many years, it was, you know, literally me in this room <laughs> trying to take on the world effectively. Um, and you're trying to, I suppose, convince and bring people along that journey with you. So about four or five years ago, you know, sustainability wasn't as hot a topic as it is today. So nowadays we get great traction and we get great, you know, exposure and it's, it's fantastic. But years ago when we were starting out in the journey, trying to show people that, you know, there was an issue and that there was a huge problem that needed to be addressed was, was a big challenge. And you couple that then with the, like I said, the lack of resources, whether that was financial or whether that was time resources, it took a great deal and again, very, very fortunate that we were able to convince a couple of people that came on that journey with us from a, you know, from an investor point of view or from, you know, uh, internal stakeholders or external stakeholders or, you know, clients and customers. And, you know, back then they took a risk and they came on the journey with us and not to say that it's not a, still a risk, but we're certainly going in the right direction. And, the stuff that we're involved in today seems to definitely be making a difference. So, um, yeah, I think just to, just to kind of just sum up in, in, in one word, really, it's just, you know, lack of resources, really, from the very big, from the get go. Mm. And uh, Tom M., I'll ask you the same question. And you are a hugely experienced businessman with a, a long career in the pharmaceutical industry before you started Pamex uh, over 20 plus years ago. And now you're on this journey with uh, de facto shaving oil to literally conquer the world and shave the world. What have you learned and what have the biggest challenges been for you along the way? Uh, a bit like Tom, there have been quite, quite the other Tom, Tom Cotter. There have been um, quite a number of challenges. And I would say, you know, looking back on it now, uh, I'd say probably the greatest challenge of all is inside my head. And I would say that, the, the, you know, the one thing I think that holds us all back in business is ourselves. And to get over that challenge where sometimes we have so, you know, I had a discussion with somebody the other day, actually, about it. This guy who's who uh, has wonderful, wonderful range of products. And he was asking for some advice. And I said, you need to get help. I said, it looks like you're doing everything you can yourself. And he said, yes. And I said, that can't last. And he said, well, the problem is I can't afford to get help. And I said, well, the, no, the problem is you can't afford not to get help. And that's where you get the challenge within your own mind. You know, you have to go for it and you have to get the right people around you and say, I'm going to go for this. Just like Tom C, as you call him, you know, that's it. You have you're on a journey. You have set your goal. You're happy in your own mind. And then all the doubts come in and say, oh, bloody hell, I can't do this myself. How am I going to get from A to B to C and things like that? But if you surround yourself with the right people, and uh, I think it can make such a difference. So in answer to your question, the challenges are, I think, principally yourself. That's the main challenge. And once you can uh, sort that out in your head in a practical and reasonable way, I think you're halfway on your journey already. That's what I think. The other challenges then would be, I would echo what uh, Tom Cotter had said there with regard to, you know, resources and things like that. You'll always think, oh, gee, I haven't enough to do this. And how am I going to get money in? How am I going to get revenue? The greatest challenge in any business for a, a commercial entity 
still, you know, for hundreds of years and will be for hundreds of years, I think, into the future, will be cash. If you run out of cash, you have no business. You might have a viable business, but if something happens that drains away your cash immediately, you have no business then. It's as simple as that. I think you're right, Tom, and profit is all fine and dandy, but if you've no cash in the bank, you're toast. Correct. And Correct. just just picking up, we're touching on themes here of, of resilience, of teamwork, of mindset, and I think that's hugely important in, in business and in your, in your personal life. Uh, Tom C., let me come back to you with, with, with your business because what you're trying to do, I think, is, is, is terrific. And uh, I'm very interested in understanding a little bit about the partnership road that you have embarked on because, quite frankly, we could be sitting here thinking, oh, Tom, he makes, uh, he makes clothing from, from plastic. Great, big deal. Is that really going to put a dent in, in the problem? And you have become much more strategic in your approach and looked at organizations to partner with organizations to help them go on their sustainability journey. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that's where I think you'll get scale and impact. So I'd love to hear more from you on, on that. I love the way you summed it up so nicely. I spend, I spend uh, my days trying to articulate it like that and you, you did it perfectly. So thanks, I'll steal, I'll steal that. Um, yeah, we started, we started our journey four years ago. And I won't dwell on it too much, but along, we started out as a consumer brand. You know, we were selling direct. We tried online. We tried on in retail stores. And uh, now I, I'm probably okay to say that, you know, we, we kind of failed, to be honest, you know, at doing it. I wouldn't say we failed. We got into stores in, you know, um, in Australia, in California, in San Francisco, in the UK, in France. But it was never enough to sustain myself, like a salary for myself or a team or anything like that. So we, at, you know, along that journey, were contacted by a number of uh, events at the beginning, a number of teams that were all promoting sustainability and wanted to be more sustainable. Can, and they were asking us, could they use our fabric? Could they use our product? And at the beginning, we're kind of going this, and that's not really what we do. And then, you know, a bit of like the... The other time was saying like a bit of a voice in the back of my head kind of saying you're struggling over here in this consumer side and there's people crying out for your product on on the other side why don't we double down and do what actually is making sense get get sales and it was it really was that i'd love to say that from the from the get-go it was you know this was the absolute plan but about two years ago we really did change that approach and we we said we are now here to assist companies on their sustainability journey so what started out with a, with a large sailing event in australia when we we did a for yachting australia had a had a junior sailing event for 700 kids and even in fairness to them back then they banned single-use plastic at the event they were really pu pushing the sustainability message can we use your fabric to create some merchandise for the event hang on a second we won't we'd actually don't do that and uh then the girl said, well, listen, we'll pay you up front and we'll pay you full whack and uh, we need 700 units. And I was kind of going, let me think about it. But yeah, certainly we can help. Um, so that was the that was really the breakthrough of kind of going, this is the this is a different direction to go in. And that has brought us from that point through now to working with, you know, a number of the four seasons around the world, a number of the leading kind of private islands around the world. We do a lot of super yachts we do a lot of yacht clubs we do diving we do a lot of the water sports it's all basically like our, our name ocean arts all centered around uh people who care about the ocean so the sports and the organizations and the companies that are are based around there and they're so they're they're crying out for solutions like these people are have all set sustainability messages and sustainability reports and they're saying you know we're going to be this environmentally friendly by 2025 but hang on a second when they go online there's actually very little help out there so then we pick up the phone and say listen guys we'll work with you on your uniform your gift shop and um, you know we'll, we'll tell you how much product, uh, plastic you'll save by using our products how much carbon you'll save by using our products and it's just like you know thank you very much that's what we've been looking for since we started out so um for us we think 
through collaboration, you can certainly have a bigger impact. Um, and it certainly seems to be going that way. And look, a lot of these bigger companies, Tom, are also on the hook and accountable to their shareholders <laughs> for taking action and proactive action in these areas. So it's a win-win situation, uh, it, it sounds like to me. And, and Tom Murphy, you, your, your vision is to shave the world, right? So, so you're sitting in the West of Ireland and yeah. you're, you've got ambitious plans to push your brand out there and, and talk about the journey that you're on with that and how far you've got and where success will take, where, where will success be and when will you know when you've got it? Gee, that's a very interesting question, that last bit particularly. Um, you know, success is different things to different people. But uh, we, we started out quite a number of years ago with the shaving oil, developing a shaving oil for the Irish market and we commercialized that. But the problem was, um, that oil came to us from the United States. So that oil had to be shipped in five gallon drums from the United States to Ireland. And originally that came by air freight into Shannon. And it was very, you know, originally actually it was uh, packaged and everything in the States and it came into Shannon. And I remember getting a phone call. This is over, this is over 20 years ago now, getting a phone call from uh, the company in Shannon who had um, in their warehouse, and they said they had just been visited by the local, I forget what they call them now, but it was basically what we knew as the drug squad. Because these little bottles had come in to Shannon, and nobody knew what a shaving oil was. Nobody knew what a shaving oil was for. And there was quite a, a amount of confusion. And a lot of people scratching their heads wondering, well, I wonder what exactly this is. So... We had to get certificates of analysis to satisfy the Gardaí that everything was kosher, it was above board, and that this was a new concept in shaving. And eventually they released the product for us, right? We've come a long way since then because to bring the product over from uh, the States, as I say, it used to fly over at first uh, and by, uh, on, on freight, air freight. Then we went to a uh, ship because it was cheaper to do it. But yet, when you think of the carbon footprint and everything involved in that, like it was absolutely crazy. So we decided we can do better and better for the planet and better for ourselves. So we developed our own formulation of the product and we call it de facto. And that product is made now here for, for me in Clare Morris, which is about 20 minutes away from Castle Bar, where I am at the moment. So it's all, it's all um, uh, Irish made, right? And it's all a 100% natural product. Now, the one thing that we do have is with regard to the, the product, how the shaving oil is packed. At the moment, it is packed in, in a plastic, which is a HDP, HD, uh, high density polyethylene, HDPE, right? Which can be fully recycled. We were given lots of other products or, or other type of containers. And unfortunately, they couldn't be recycled. So we said, we have to do our bit for the planet. And so the, all the packaging, can be recycled at the moment. You just rinse out the little bottle, put it in the recycle bin, and the outer packaging can all be recycled. And there was a time when we had all of that sealed in single-use plastic. That has now, we've stopped that now completely. There's no single-use plastic anymore. And the other thing that we do with it is, and you know, we're only a small outfit, but what we do is uh, we have the option on our website of uh, defactoshave.com and if people want to buy the product without any packaging, we will send them the product without any packaging at all, which that has reduced our packaging, our overall packaging enormously. It has reduced our carbon footprint enormously. We have a long way to go. Eventually, we will get to a stage where we won't use pack and we won't use plastic bottles at all, even though they can be fully recycled. We will probably change to something else, but not glass. Glass is heavy. Glass can be recycled all right, but the problem is glass is dangerous. People use this shaving oil in the bathroom, and if there's a tile floor and if the bottle slips out of your hand and it breaks all over the floor, it's dangerous, actually. So we're looking at different type of materials for the, for the, the oil to fit in and materials that will be compatible with the oil, that the oil won't have any adverse effect on the inside of the packaging that it will all be fully compatible so that's the stage we're at at the moment 
and you know sustainability and everything is very important and i know we're talking on earth day today it's very important to us it, going back i'd say four or five years ago it was it wasn't something that we really had on the agenda to be quite honest but as, as tom cotter alluded to yeah it has certainly come up onto the agenda now mm. and it's important to us getting to your second question what does success mean to us i think success means if we could convince more of the people starting with the irish people to change from using um shaving foams or gels and switching over to using de facto shaving oil because the difference it makes is unbelievable and i don't know if, if, if you realize it but we did our, our um, we did a survey there recently and we did some serious research into it there uh, there are approximately 20 million cans of shaving foam or gel going into landfill in Ireland every single year. I was absolutely gobsmacked. And the chap that we got to do this research for us, I asked him, I said, could you, could you please check those figures? And I can't get the picture of 20 million shaving foam cans into my head, how big it would be, how, how high it would be in Crow Park. And what would the mountain of cans look like? But 20 million in Ireland. And that is taking into account that only, you know, a certain percentage of people shave every day. Some people don't shave or they shave are, are infrequently. And it takes into account men and women and only adults. Because a lot of people don't realize, even in Ireland, an awful lot of people don't realize that shaving foams and cans cannot be recycled. And it's an argument that we are challenged with quite a lot because customers come back to us and say, hold on a minute now here, Tom, you know, these are aluminium and aluminium is very easy to recycle. And they're absolutely right. Aluminium is very easy to recycle. But the only problem about it is you can't recycle aluminium when it is pressurized and all the foams and gels are pressurized. So they have to go to landfill. And even the Irish, the government landfill or the government website, waste.ie, they have it up on it here, it, you know, hazardous uh, aerosols fall into the category of hazardous waste and therefore cannot be placed in the household recycle bin. When I even told that to members of my family recently, they wouldn't believe me. I said, I'm serious. And that goes for deodorant cans, shaving foams, gels, all those, they cannot be recycled. So if we could get them to make one small change, to switch over to shaving oil, it would make a huge, huge difference. That's and, a success for me. Uh, very good. And uh, that's a, a stark statistic, Tom, yeah. that 20 million cans in the middle of Crow Park. My gosh, yeah. uh, it sort of uh, makes you think. And there is opportunity, but there's also an opportunity to educate. And shows like this help people understand the fact that there are alternatives to yes. what they're currently using. And most folks want to do the right thing. So there is an opportunity here to make a simple change in your everyday life and do your bit. And let's get back to Earth Day because Earth Day is at the same time every year in April uh, across the globe. And action on climate and climate change is very much in the news right now. And I was looking at Sky News this morning and the headline was, survival depends on real climate action as governments get together for the climate summits around uh, various different issues. So action is, is required. Mm. And sometimes yeah. when you think about climate change, it's so big that it's just not my problem. It's too big for me to tackle. I'll just shut it down and keep doing what I'm doing. So the ability to make small changes in your life, whether it's moving to uh, shaving oil like de facto or buying a polo shirt that is made from recycled materials there are yes. opportunities to make these changes so uh, tom c what are your thoughts on on well on earth day and your business and your sustainability credentials and how do you feel about it all given what you're doing yeah it's it's Earth Day, and it's also, um, it, there's a thing called Fashion uh, Revolution Week as well. So that's on this week, uh, where it's, you know, tackling the challenges in the fashion industry. I'm quite funny, as you picked up already, um, Tom, Tom M is the, is the positive one, and I kind of the cynical one, but I blow, I go, 
I go in phases where I get really, really down about how bleak the outcome is. And then I have other days of like how actually how, you know, we need to all bond together and 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 to make a difference. At the moment, I'm kind of in the middle. I'm just after it. Uh, we're at the moment involved in a project where we're trying to take fishing nets from um, the fisheries in Ireland and convert them into into pellets and then take them into injection molding and make products out of them at the moment. So I'm just after coming down from um, from Killy Beggs where I was for the last uh, two days uh, working with uh, with the company up there and you see the amount of waste that comes from the fishing industry and like how we can play a major part in recycling those nets into product. Now that's an industry that hasn't been, you know, touched in terms of sustainability. And there's so much uh, media attention now being focused on it, not to the, I said, not to the fault of the fishermen, not to the fault of the net manufacturers. There simply hasn't been an answer to date and there still isn't. And you touched on it there about the, you know, the, the, the countries coming together and the governments coming together and, the, the European Union are putting in huge, uh, huge efforts to make these industries fully circular. So as a business, I'm kind of seeing it as, you know, I'm at the I'm at the business development end where we're trying to take raw material and turn it into uh, into product. And it's there's also companies at the say the logistics side of it that will actually do the collection and they'll you know, they'll find the net and then they'll recycle it. And there's people in the middle that will also process it. So my view is basically that the only way that we can make a big difference is again through, and I said it already, is through collaboration. And that I treat that in with my with my business collaboration with other companies on the business side of it. But when I look back down the supply chain, I also have to be, I also have to collaborate with manufacturers and um and like non-for-profits and people who are doing the right thing to get me product. So we work, you know, with a select few manufacturers. We have one manufacturer in, po- in Portugal, one manufacturer in Latvia, um, but they've been hand selected because they are doing the right thing. So they only use, like you pointed out, they only use the right fabrics and they're very much above board when it comes to um, uh, staff welfare. Um, they're, they, they offset their carbon on a yearly basis. Um, and they're really looking, like I said, to do the right thing and to better an industry that is 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 falling. Um, the same then when you look at the fishing industry, there's people that are doing uh, that are already having an impact um, in in that industry. Um, and I genuinely think that if if you're in a business at the moment and you want to move to sustain to a sustainable option, you, there's people that are already thought have already thought about it. And you just have to go and find those people and collaborate with them. That's all you have to do. Similar to way Tom M has done his packaging, and um, you know there's a there's a company out there that has developed recyclable uh, plastic packaging, HDPE packaging, and it's he's now able to talk really passionately about their their packaging and that they're doing the right thing. And that goes. It doesn't matter what industry you're in. There's there's answers out there to solve your problem and. If we can, if we can find and marry enough of those together, then we can actually have big impact. And just picking up on that and, and shifting gears slightly, you're you're both BITA members, guys, and uh, relatively new members, I would say. And I'm just curious what your perceptions about the organisation have been so far. Has it been a benefit to be part of the network? Uh, what have you enjoyed most? What are your thoughts? Tom M first, please. Um, in- interesting question, I must say, John, because I hadn't heard of BITA uh, until about last October. And I was in touch with a chap uh, from uh, Workflow in County Carlow. And he said to me, you have to join BITA. And I said, what the hell is BITA? I hadn't heard of it. And he told me what it was about. He introduced me to Paul. And when I heard of Paul's name first, Paul Whitnell, I said, well, this is an English guy now. I said, I wonder how I'll get on with this fella. And we had a chat and he was a a Cork native, still has the Cork accent. And he has wonderful friends who live approximately five minutes from me here in Castlebar. He knows everybody. But he told me the basis of of, uh, the the organization, what it does, how it networks. And uh, the one thing that I 
like about it and has become very apparent to me and i say this you know with all sincerity is that the people there in bita are so willing to help i was really bowled over with it i have been involved in quite a number of companies and sorry quite a number of organizations um, throughout ireland and further afield but i've never sensed the the, the um determination to help others and not look for anything in return. That was extraordinary to me. And the people I've met are very sincere, very genuine. Uh, I'm doing business with one of the guys now, uh, uh, Jonathan Slobom from Peppermoth, uh, Peppermoth Marketing in the UK. And he's doing a project with me at the moment. Uh, I have met some other wonderful contacts and who are helping us with business because it was another end of our business in the dental business and we will be launching in the UK very shortly. We're getting assistance through members of BITA with regard to that. And I would never even have thought about it. Uh, I like, I, I think the network uh, on a Friday morning, particularly for the London group, I haven't um, been involved with uh, or got in touch with the Liverpool or Manchester group yet, but uh, with the London group, I think it's superb. Uh, I try to make it every second Friday and uh, as, as best I can. But I think the setup, the technical way it's run, I was very skeptical at first, but it, it runs exceptionally well. I think it is very, very good. That's where I met yourself, John. And uh, I, I, I think it is excellent. So as far as I'm concerned, I have spread the word to a number of my business colleagues and friends here in the West. And one chap in particular rang me up afterwards and he said, it took me months and months, he said, and I'm still trying to get to the purchasing officer in one of the main boroughs in London for his product. And he said, I got in touch with Paul Whitnell. I have a meeting next week with the guy. He said, this is extraordinary. And it's people who are anxious to help other people. And I have made it clear to the other individuals that I've met through BITA, is that I'm here to help too. If I can help them with any of my little bit of wisdom or anything like that, I will certainly do so. And that's what I like about uh, BITA. I think it's wonderful. Uh, I like it. The people are genuine, they're sincere, and they're willing to help. And the other thing about it, they're honest. Say, I'm sorry, I have no contacts in that area. Let's move on. But I know somebody who might have, and I'll introduce you to X, Y, and Z. I think it's good. Very good. Tom C., your thoughts? Yeah, absolutely echo everything that Tom said there. Absolutely. Um, we're even newer than, than October. I think I've only been engaged for the last kind of three months. Skeptical at first, as Tom said. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing for me when you go into these is like, again, I, I touched on, you're, you're kind of short in resources and you're coming, you're coming in and you kind of feel like this is going to take up a lot of my time and you know that, that there won't be a, uh, there won't be an outcome or something like that but it's been completely the opposite really enjoyable to be um i suppose on on you know in, involved in conversations on a variety of different topics i've been introduced to i'd say well in excess of 10 people in the last you know 3 months um all very relevant all bringing new ideas all really really keen to help and promote us into their networks um Nobody, again, I say this, you know, really, um, I say this, that no one is looking for anything in return. I think we are all a big believer, like Tom Emma was saying, is like, if we can help anybody else as well, we do it. So what goes around comes around kind of attitude. Um, and it's just been a really genuine group. Guys, fantastic. And that's that's really uh, good feedback, especially from relatively new members uh, to hear that the network is supporting you and actively uh, looking to, to help you. Um, and I'm conscious of time here. So I wanted to just finish with one or two other questions for what is very clear to me. You're both successfully building businesses with strong sustainability credentials and sustainability through the DNA of your organizations. So reflecting on that, what advice would you give to other business folks or entrepreneurs watching the show today to, to, to help them on that journey to, to become more sustainable, more green, and do some of the sorts of things that you guys have been doing? What, what's the best advice you can give? 
Tom C to start. Uh, yeah, I've probably dug into it a tiny bit in, my, in, in answer to my last question, but um, if people are starting out in the journey and you have no idea where to begin, just reach out. That's, you know, I think we've just mentioned it there from the bit of what goes around comes around. There's people that are further along the journey than I am. I am not an expert. I am certainly learning. And every day I, I learn better and more improved ways to do it. I really believe that if you're starting out, it might seem like a mountain to overcome. And it, for me, especially, we're very critical internally on a daily basis um, of ourselves, of, you know, our supply chain going, going you know, it's, we can't make clothes in Ireland, so we have to make it in Portugal. But then you get wrapped up into the shipping of clothes from Portugal to Ireland. And you're kind of going, there isn't a perfect solution. You know, that's the one of the things that you pass on to people. There isn't a perfect solution right now, but just take it in bite-sized steps. And, and if you can improve your single-use plastic, very easy thing, not easy, but a very... Uh, understandable uh, goal for an organization. Let's try and reduce our single use plastic. Now, if you're in the food industry, that might not be possible, but you might be able to go to, uh, you know, you might be able to reduce it by 30, 40, 50%. So just in bite, take it in bite size, because I think people can get overwhelmed by the, you know, trying to go from zero to completely sustainable within, within a short pace of time. Tom Murphy, thoughts? Yeah, I, I, I agree exactly with what uh, Tom Cotter has said there. I think and he's, he's covered it all. Uh, the one thing I'd say is uh, always have an open mind and always be learning. I think I think that's that's what I would say. And the other thing about it is, again, I would echo what Thomas said there. You know, if you see a huge problem and you think, well, I'm not going to have much of an impact myself or my friends or family, whatever it is. I think just take every step and a small step can make a big, big difference. That's why I say, you know, the small step of changing from shaving or shaving foam and gels to using a de facto shaving oil, you know, makes such a difference. And, you know, the other uh, acronym of T-A-M, team, together, everyone achieves more. So each little step adds up. We're not going to solve it all today. Not one of us. There's nobody on the planet that can do it by themselves. But if we all get together, we can make a huge difference. Mm. And if we do one step exit, for instance, as, as Tom Cotter said there, you know, even single use plastic, let's be determined to cut down. If we each family just does one little bit, that adds up to a huge amount. Wise words and good suggestions there, guys. And the last question I have for you both, how can people get a hold of your products? Tom M. Uh, very simple. We sell online to the world and we're on a, on a mission now to save the planet one shave at a time. And you can contact us at defactoshave.com. Perfect. Tom M. Sorry, see? Yeah, absolutely similar. We're oceanr.co. Uh, a lot of people get, uh, we don't have an M at the end. So oceanr.co, you'll find all of our our products. And like I said, feel free to reach out. Uh, we're here to help. So if anybody has any questions or, um, or wants answers on their sustainability uh, journey, then we're, 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 we're here and we're all ears. Fantastic. Guys, look, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an interesting journey. You're on interesting journeys. We've learned a lot and I've appreciated your time. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a bit of business. My name is John Fitzgerald. Thanks for joining us. All the best for now. Thank you, John. Thank you. Cheers, John.